You're listening to That Great Mank Pod, Greater Manchester's community podcast. Top one, our kid. Hi, welcome to episode four of That Great Mank Pod. In this episode, Damien and I chat with actor Liam Collins about the fantastic short film he wrote and starred in My Toughest Battle, which tackles mental health from the view of a young boxer. You can watch that by searching for My Toughest Battle on YouTube. We chat with Liam as to why and how he got the film made. As with everything with Liam, expect brutal honesty, but absolutely worth a listen for all the budding filmmakers out there. We also talk about actors' life in general with Liam and how it impacts his own mental health, especially during lockdown. The arts, certainly with regards to actors, is an absolute minefield for mental health, mental well-being. So it's great for me to hear Liam's point of view to some of the issues that piss me off. For me, listening to how Liam has changed his relationship to acting life without losing any of the passion, partly due to lockdown and family, is massively important to the many people out there in that business who I care about. You will struggle to find anyone as open and honest about this than Liam. And of course, we have a laugh. This episode is dedicated to Hans and Pete, who might need to change his nickname. We normally start this off by asking people a question, and we, and we change that every time. Now, you've probably not listened to the other podcasts. I mean, I haven't, to be honest. I mean, who, who wants to listen to two, two old farts droning on? But let's just say, if... Um, I'm going to give you some names, right? And what right, I want mate. you to do... <laughs> And what I want you to do is I want you to put them in order of who is the best looking in your eyes, right? And you've got to be absolutely 100% here, right? Okay. So we're going to go with, right, we're, we're putting you in this. Me, Damien, Andy Burnham, right? And my mate, Anson Pete, who doesn't have Zoom, so you'll just have to go with it. Well, let's start off by going Anson Pete, I don't know if it's ironic that he isn't handsome. We're going to have to put him last because I don't know him. I don't not seen him. It's only fair that we we can only put him last. Good thinking. I'm going to make it easier for you and put me at number one because you've got to be honest in this game, unfortunately. And it took me a while to get to this and I didn't kiss a girl until I was 18. So I need that validation of putting myself number one, I'm afraid. Exactly. This is where it gets trickier because it's it's out of the... The two Ronnies here, and it's it goes down to uh, you, you and Damien here. Don't forget, we've got Andy Burnham. Andy, in this sorry, as well. yeah, sorry. So I would say, see, funny you say that because I've had a, I've had a few people recent, a few in conversation. Saying, oh, and and Andy Burnham's quite a looker. I'm going, yeah, is it? Oh, I, don't, I don't depend. Is it the is it the power? I don't know, but that is a, that is a hard question. That might I be think the Kagil. My- is it the Kagil? Might be the Kagil. He's getting a lot of people on side. And I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we go me first. Maybe we might have to, you know, listen, Paul. It's the beard, the hair. We might have to put you second. Because I think like, that, okay. Yeah. Might I, be, I, we've not discussed We've not discussed this before, Andy, either, have we? This is a genuine, genuine. Right. Okay. Carry on. So basically yeah. now we've got, you've got to choose between one of my closest friends, right, on this earth, a man who's made a massive heart, one of the nicest people I know, and Damien. <laughs> I knew that was coming. That was so obvious. <laughs> uh, I know, listen, we've got to, we've got to get Damien uh, good old third, if not maybe joint joint second. Oh no, no, we can't go a word. Can't have joint second, but we we've got to put him. Uh, we've got to move third there just because of his uh, great work that he does and those um, those um, yes, not, guys. Well, yeah, right. Even okay. Though- so, 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 so basically, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take that any day of the week. I think you're right there, to be honest. Right. Anyway, can you let t- tell us who you are? We know who you are, but tell us who you are and what you're about, what you're doing. So, um, if you don't know, obviously, Liam, Liam Collins, Liam Francis Collins. If we're going by titles, if we're going for the uh, Daniel Day Lewis one day, um, and yeah, uh, an actor, I guess. Struggling actor through the pandemic, but at the end of the day, I am. That's that's why I've managed to pay my bills on for the past three years. Technically, still managing to do it now through the pandemic, although it's not with um, you know TV credits and stuff. But it still is a form of acting. I'm still getting paid to do little side gigs, uh, so I'm lucky to do that. And um, yeah, at the moment, it's 
it's just about keeping the faith. But I would always say um, I'm an actor because that is what I believe I am. And I believe I was, as she is as it sounds, a profession that I found very late, well, I say late on, 20, 21. And um, as she as it sounds, I did know I was going to, I did know I wanted to do that for the rest of my life when I got out of uh, an acting class one day. How old are you now, Liam? 30 years young, although my playing age is 20 <laughs> to 26 without this beard. So, you know. 20 to 26. What's your playing age, Damien? Oh, the 70, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to hesitate, mate. I reckon I could probably get away with mid 60s. <laughs> mid mid 60s to. No, I, I reckon I could. I probably get my age. I don't. I don't think I look. I don't think you look fifty, Damien. Let's talk about us for a little bit. I don't. That's think just I the fat that fills out the wrinkles, Paul. That's it's true, mate. It's true. You see, we can always lose weight and get better. Whereas, where's Liam got to go from here? Hey, listen, <laughs> it's only going to go worse for him, isn't it? Peaked <laughs> bad. The teeth. The, the teeth. The teeth aren't bad. You've got. You both look like you've got a, a set of you know decent teeth, and you know teeth. Teeth go a long yeah. way, don't they? <laughs> That's 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 lovely, that Liam. So basically, we've got nice teeth. Well, this, this is what the women like. I'm being told. Okay, now this is the worst day ever. This, isn't it? It's destroying. It's destroying my mental well-being. You've oh, come on cool. here. No, I mean, what I do? I, I first. Uh, I'm trying to think. Actually, Liam, well, I think you 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 maybe approached uh, or sent me a message when when the when your film came out, My Toughest Battle. Uh, and that's how we got in touch, isn't it? Because you were, I think, I think the film was made, done, dusted, and it was the you were having a premiere uh, or a sort of premiere in Manchester. Uh, we were having the premiere that never became a premiere because that day, I don't know what more stuff could have gone wrong on that day, but the fucking, tra- I mean, the Spice Girls were in Manchester that night. There had been a massive eight car pile up on the. M- I mean, no one could get my friends that. When the friends that were always going to be there were three hours late. The whole city was in care. I don't know why it had to be that day, but there was about 10 people. But the people that, that might had turned up, but no, yeah. it was just, it was an, it was, couldn't have been a, a worse day for whatever the reason, but it is what it is. I mean, I, you know, to be honest, I, mean, I was a little disappointed because I thought it was a free bar and it was for a little bit, wasn't it? But then I think we had well, to start let, paying then, didn't we? Let's be honest, we didn't pay. <laughs> we didn't no, pay. No, we didn't pay. Didn't and we were we were me and you and the two others were the last were the last people to uh, to leave. Uh, you know, I just stayed stayed there as long as I could. No, you laying down again, Paul. Well, he's, he's it, terrible for that. He'll drink your drinks and then he'll. You think you're on a promise and he's gone. You know, you know what? I mean? I, I, I'm stood there and you know as you do having a chat and there was some re- there were some really nice people. In fact, I can't remember the lad's name, but it's the lad who was running the uh, the mental health. Uh, kind of drop-ins in Alte. Um Yeah, he's... Um, what was it called? He runs... The men's club thing. Yeah, men's club. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. Great he's guy. A, a lovely, lovely bloke, so I was having a good chat with him and then stood there and then Keaton walks in. Keaton, who I know because he's done stuff with Matt Made and everything. I didn't know Keaton was in the film. Uh, and then Keaton walks in and Keaton was with his... With his she's, she's his agent, isn't she, Jess? Yeah, Ke- Keaton walked in. I think he thought he was going um, on the red carpet at the Odeon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I turned up in a pair. Listen, I, I don't, you know, you know me in this game, I'd, I'd do what I want, but I turned up in a nice pair of jeans, a little tight T-shirt showing the shoulders. And uh, yeah, Keaton dressed up in a full free piece. But listen, you've got to do what <laughs> <laughs> He did as well. He even had the spinning bow tie. Yeah, but listen, if I was him, I would have done the same. If if it would have done, if it would have worked how it was supposed to work, and the fucking day wasn't chaos, and people, we had a we had a, you know, we did have press coming down. They couldn't fucking get there. It, it was a nightmare. But yeah, yeah, that's where. Um, but yeah, carry on, Paul. Sorry. I've, no, I've no, I was going to say, mate. I I um I, I don't go to those kind of things. Never have done really. Uh, went because I really liked the idea of what you were doing. Um, and and to be honest, it, it was one of those things where it was kind of like there was loads of other stuff on. I went, no, no, I'm going to go, going to go and see this because I really like the idea that you put this together. Uh, and I thought it was ace, mate. I mean, you know, I mean, we can talk about the film, but in terms of the event itself, uh, it was great 
to see you sat there because when the film was on as well as watching the film, I, I kind of, I always look around and look at other people's, it's like when I go to the theatre, certainly if I'm involved in anything, I kind of look to see what other people's, whether they're smiling, whether they're not, whether they're, and, and, you know, looking around that room, there was a lot of virtually everyone other than <laughs> me at the time, absolutely glued to the screen. Uh, and when you go up and did your speech at the end, um, you know, it was it was very moving, mate. I mean, it, it was it was it was heartfelt. The film was great. You got a great response. Uh, everybody who I met there who was involved in the film was really really passionate about it and had their own reasons. Uh, some of which they may have told me, others which they may have not. You know, so. Um, <coughs> but yeah, no, I was I, I was really impressed, mate. It's, it's a great film. Can you can you can you tell us what my toughest battle? is about and then we can have a chat about i mean what i'm interested in as well and want people to listen to is how you actually the process of how you got that made because you you seem to you know and we spoke about it in the past you kind of like well yeah just did this it's a fucking amazing achievement right it's- uh, and i'll say that and i'll keep saying that um but yeah tell us tell us what my toughest battle is about well it's about um a boxer called jamie who is um is his profession, you know, he's got a fire coming up. The fact the box inside of it, as Paul would know, is, is just a backdrop, but it, it gives it an appeal as a, as a sports perspective of, of, you know, from that side of it. But it's ultimately about a person that um, is engaged. He's got this sort of, you know, normal life, but he's suffering from depression, but he actually doesn't know what it is. He's never dealt with it before. And it's about him coming to terms with, you know, the feeling of it and, and trying to explain trying to explain to the audience how it affects maybe um you know his his fiance in the film she you know kind of thinks there's something going on he's having an affair for example or whatever because it's it does affect everyone in a different way if you if you've never had it or you don't know or if you're a friend of the family or whichever so I wanted to try and get that um across in the film as much, as best as best as I could. Well you did mate um there's no two ways about that the, st- the story itself i mean you just i mean you you tell us who wrote that by the way so who wrote I, my... I wrote it and uh, right. i have uh, jim dial some credit because he helped with the ending because i i had a certain ending he said well what about this so i have to give him some credit and he's a fucking great guy but yeah i i ultimately wrote it i wrote it in and this is why i said i don't class myself as you know I kind of think it was a fluke because I did write that in about 20 minutes in my bedroom and I, and I wrote it just about my own experiences, what I thought. Because um, when I write, I can't, um, I just sort of write as a conversation of just, oh, well, you know, I'll just write that conversation and, and try and look at it as from an audience perspective. But yeah, I wrote, I wrote that. And then I remember I wrote it and I thought, fucking hell, I don't really know what, if this is any good, I remember I'd sent it to, I remember I sent it to my friend though, and I said, what do you think of this? I think I'll give, I think I let my mum read it. She said, I don't fucking get what this is. I said, listen, you shouldn't know what it is because you don't know anything. So just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember going, in, uh, need to find, um, you know, I don't even know what a producer does really. And I just put an ad out. I had no money <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, and I think I paid Susie maybe hundred. I said, "Listen, hundred pound. Get get this done next week, and it'll just continue from there. It'll roll in weekly." And uh, I let her know very quickly. Listen, God, God, be honest with you. I have no money, um, but if you, you know, and she luckily she loved the the script, and she only would really take projects that are about um, a purpose rather than like a passion project about you know whatever. Um, and um, and it went from there and it took you know it does take a long time it took maybe a year and a half to get that to get that made with you know trying to get uh, the crew together trying to get more I mean the money that is involved in as you know you know Paul you made stuff yourself the money in these things is just you know unbelievable I, I didn't understand when I was even started acting or of watching films when, when you hear of say you know James Bond's got it, it costs 300 million to make. I used to go, why the fuck, you know, why? Well, that's just, I don't get that. And I learned very quickly just from the short film of why it actually does cost that much because what's mine, 40 minutes, 
and we needed thousands and thousands and thousands just for little things like I remember again a call one day saying oh you know we need to pay this it's 600 quid you know people need to eat I'm like fucking hell I didn't even think of the, the food for for 18 people on set for three days it, it's just money left and right and and when we finished it we actually still needed three four grand and uh and Susie was saying, oh, we'll do a crowdfund. I said, no, nah, fuck that. I'm not doing another one of them. It's just fucking, you know, and I just paid for it. Uh, I just said, listen, let's just fucking do whatever. And, and you know, and I, and I did put myself in debt for that film, but I just don't give a fuck because it's it was something that I wanted to do. And and, I, and again, it's the jury's still out on it because I think it's a shame about any short film because it's just, it's the same as, um, I guess acting in general it's, it's if even though it's on YouTube or whatever it just it has to go to the right hands and it has to festivals you're either in them or you're not it's political you've got this it's just it's one of them same with anything I guess yeah I mean we had that discussion it always gets me that and I, I, I kind of understand it to, to a little bit a little bit when people make the films and especially when it's I mean if it's a bit of fluff then I, I, I get it putting it in festivals but when it's something that actually is about something and you know, can, can make a difference. And I think your film does and can then having it around for, or not showing it to people for, for the best for months and months and months to move it around festivals. Now I understand, you know, I understand it could be, it, it certainly is an actor, then there's a chance that someone will see it and they may put money into <coughs> it and remake it or give you opportunities to get all that. But it's, you know, t- hawking it around festivals. Is, and I, again, we had that discussion and I, and I get where you're coming from and why you did it. Um, but yeah, it's that whole it's that whole process that is now built up around short films. So there's now an industry now that is designed to suck more money from people who spent shed loads of money making the films in the first place. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think I think from a filming standpoint, it's more when you write something and I've never this was the first time, when you're acting in summer, you think, Oh, you know, this is this is great and whatever. But when you, when you've wrote something, I guess you get a bit, a lot more attached to it and you think, Oh, and, and it's that, and I've learned so much <clears throat> from making that short film of maybe what I would do next time, or maybe I wouldn't. But the reality of it is you just think when, when it's something you're passionate about, I remember a famous, you know, it's like, I remember hearing a podcast of Oliver Stone talking about when you talk about actors getting Oscars and the banging on about politics. And I agree with, if you're an actor, you should shut, you should shut your mouth. But the problem is if you are passionate about something so much, it is very difficult to just not, not speak up and speak about it. And when it comes to mental health, that's something. And, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an idiot. I didn't just, I obviously made that film to shed light and I really, hand on heart, that was it. But obviously this 10% that I go, oh, well, I would like to, for someone to see this, a good cast and director to see this or for it to do well because of this. But the reality is there's no formula. I, I naively or delusionally thought with the having broke and having the, the, you know, it got a lot of money that went into it. I thought, well, this, how can this not do well? It, it's not shit. It's well made. It's, it, it's the production's really good. You know, how can it not do well? And then when it doesn't or it doesn't and you think there's no, there's no, yeah, you kind of have to just go. Well, that, that's just the that's just in the game. Do you know what, mate? It's what, that it's, not, sorry, Dame. Is that on. not the way that the we have this discussion all the time, Liam, about the way that the arts funding and structures is very sort of empiric. You know, you have to be, you have to know people. You know, and it's all seen London based and all this sort of stuff. And they talk, they give this sort of side glance to communities and to health and to issues. But it's not the main core of what the arts funding and stuff is about. Do you know what I mean? And th- this seems a total disproportion to a project like you're doing that can, and especially showing that misunderstanding from family members. You know, people focus on the individual and what they're going through, but it's that. Oh, are you having an affair? Which adds added pressure onto that individual that's going through a really shit time. So mm-hmm. to highlight stuff like that, that's they're the projects that the arts council and other organisations should be funding and supporting that actually start a conversation because you see these mental health days and it's uh, if you're struggling, talk. If you're struggling, this. But what next? Do you know what I, I mean? When we talk about the acting stuff, I dream of. I don't care about 
fame and all that. But what I would love to have a platform is is to be able to do. When I look at like what Marcus Rashford's doing, he's using a platform to do some to do some great things. And I I would dream one day that I know I can still do it now, but from a business standpoint, having that platform one day, maybe having those millions and millions of followers, I would love to use that to not post about a pair of trainers I've got, or I'm doing this, but also as well to say, you know, do this and do that and try and get things implicated. You know, I have a bizarre dreams of one day trying to get, you know, government in a position where rather than, you know, dispensing antidepressant prescriptions, it's, a prescription to go in a, a self-deprivation tank or it's a prescription to do some yoga, it's to do exercise. And, you know, I've got this whole system and I would love to, you know, this is a story for another time, but I really, um, you know, I, I have studied and, I, and I'm and i no expert. I, I can't say that I'm a qualified doctor by any means. I, I work with doctors a lot and, I, and I've studied mental health as, as much as I can, but it's only my opinion, but... I would love to uh, one day um, be involved in, in projects and try and make um, to make a difference. But, you know, it's it's a slow process. But do you know what, man? Again, and I keep saying this and you keep saying it, we've had this discussion in terms of, well, you say, well, you know, it's, it's not really been successful, but it's, then it's a case of, well, how do you do what... Uh, how do you decide what's successful? What I decide is successful is, is who it affects. I've seen your film and it's affected me and the beauty of it when i first saw it was if i'd have watched that film on my own then when you know you still do start thinking you've got no one to talk to whereas it was great afterwards we had a chat about it uh and then we had a few beers and whatever but it was just great to to be able to chat about experiences I and mean, i've had i i've had run-ins with my and I, and I still do with my mental health i think most people do i think a lot more people are getting on on board with that and seeing that it's not a it's just your health you know it's it's just another part of your health but it needs more people uh to to, to not just get the message out there but to i mean to, to 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 come up with an idea and then turn that idea into a short film right is fucking amazing Right, it is. I mean, that is just so many people, and I've never, and I, you know, I don't see myself as being part of of your industry. I work on the on the outskirts of it because I want to do it my way. Uh, but speak to that many people who say what they're going to do and how they're going to do this, and they do absolutely fuck all, other than talk about it. And when other people step up, they're the first ones there going, well, you know didn't really have any car chases or there were no dinosaurs in it or you know do you know what i mean it's just they'll come up and they'll criticize but they will not have the balls to do what you did and make something um that will you, you, you don't know how many people have seen that film in the privacy of their own home and that it's absolutely effective that, that, that they may have thought well you know i'm not feeling great maybe that is the case or it could be somebody's missus uh that watches it and think oh, oh, maybe that's oh, the case. you know oh. Hey Paul, as you say that, don't get me wrong, guy. You know, even at the at the premiere, the great who also contributed to the film and allowed us to film uh, once in, once upon a bride, which is a if anyone's getting married out there, feel free to go down. Uh, it won't be me for a while ever, maybe. But uh, you know, the the lovely um, people from there, they their son, um, you know, was affected, and when they saw the film coming up to me, you know, in tears, talking about the struggles they've had with their son. And when I did a talk at um, Manchester City, I had, you know, a woman, it was actually Louise Mincham, who was the BBC anchor that does the morning breakfast show, um, who did say she did was going to get me on the breakfast show, but didn't. That's another story. But listen, everyone's busy. But she she did a Q&A with me uh, about the film. And, you know, this woman afterwards um, said that her husband committed suicide about a year ago you know and she was just in tears telling and I, and I started crying and, and listen that's the that's the that's the Oscar if you like of of getting any gratification for for, for that film and, and I guess the plus uh, of, of that film is what Susie always says as well is it's not something that is ever outdated because it's something that 
will always uh, connect with people and it's an important message. It's never, ever going to go away. So the, the jury, it might be a case that one day when I am killing it in Hollywood, it is then massive, you know, it's even more bigger and it, and it, a lot more people will see it as well. But I think um, it's just more of the, the message and, and if it was, and it was great to be able to, because in my family, it's something that's very, I think I mentioned to previously, you know, my uh, granddad, unfortunately, you know, took his own life. My cousin did. So it's a very, uh, for me, it was a, and in that film, there was, ref, you know, names as well of, uh, you know, my granddad's name was my second. So I use little nuances in the film to, as sort of homages to, uh, to people are, which again was amazing. And to see something you have written, I mean, I've never, believe it or not, I've actually only ever watched bits of it with the sound off because I can't watch any, I can't watch it just because it's me. And and that, it sounds weird because if anything, it's a weakness because actors should really watch the stuff because they can look at what they're doing wrong. I just, it just, I'll curl up and throw up. So I've only ever seen bits of it with the sound down. Um, but seriously? I, no, seriously. I, I, I can't get my head around that. I mean, let's be honest. Most actors, right? Most actors are just show offs. Aren't Listen, they the show offs, and they, they I, love I, it. I love, I love it. <laughs> but you, 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 that you've never watched that film all the way through, going fucking hell, I'm good. No, I've, I've never, <laughs> I've never watched. I know I'm good, but uh, no, <laughs> no, I've got a uh, acting is. The thing about acting, which is so weird, is that was the first sort of... Well, I, I'll never forget that first day on set where I naively... And this and you know, and this is a good thing, but I I believe that in anything, whether it's an athlete sport, you have to, in yourself, you have to believe that you're one of the best in the world for me because if you don't, no one else is going to believe it. And I've always had that mindset with anything. Uh, um, and when I got on that set, I remember thinking, well, I'm just going to going here, I'm going to fucking blow everyone away, you know, Brooke, whoever. And when I got on this set, I remember very quickly, do you know what? You've got, you got a lot to learn. And working with Brooke, who are naively, you know, you just, you just sort of maybe dismiss of this stigma attached to. This is, sorry, just to explain. So this is Brooke from. Yeah. Brooke Vincent from uh, Coronet Street, been on it right. since seven. Um, and the thing was that she's, you know, you've dismissed that, that when someone's been on something for 20 year, odd years and they've been doing it day in, day out, no matter what it is, they are just, they just can do it like it's karaoke. And I learned that very quickly that, you know what, acting is about, unfortunately, as harsh as it is when you don't get the work, you will only ever learn by, by being on set and doing plays and, and doing it as much as you can because it is a, it, it's that kind of, kind of thing and, and a lot of stuff that I did wrong which I thought fucking hell, I didn't even know about that or the director would explain to me something which I'd never heard before and it was just interesting because I, I really did and when we shot the scene you know it was me that was like fucking up and going on and it and I just naively thought that you know listen I, I'm this king dick and I'm the best and it was humbling in a way but good in a way that um, the experience I learned was, was great yeah, but it's that whole mindset, mate. I mean, I get, I absolutely get the mindset to go in there. But if you didn't have that mindset, you would never have, not, you would never have been in that position. No, you would I, never have been in that position. And the fact that you are willing to learn, and you know, it's great to get everyone in that position and they're committed and just say, you know what, uh, you know, you're gonna have to walk me through this. And most people will kind of go, yeah, all right because they've bought into the project and it's the same with what we do with the charity. You get, you have to, you have to get people to buy in to what we're trying to do. I, uh, and then you have to do it. No I, I've what worked, it takes. Exactly. And before acting, I, I always worked in, in sales and marketing and I was always good at building relationships and getting clients to, uh, and smoozing them and doing what I had to do. So I, I've always looked at it as I need to, you know, sell myself and do and do the best I can. And, and and I think it's the behind the scenes, you know, with my toughest battle. And again, no one, the reality is no one cares. But for me as an artist, I really wanted to, you know, I, I love, I adore the craft and it sounds cheesy and I'm sounding like I'm an artist and all this bullshit. But the reality is I don't, I've, I loved it and I, and I lost all the weight and I didn't sleep for two days because the character was supposed to be... F- 
in this ca- and I did and I remember I made a playlist of the most depressing songs you could think of <laughs> and I remember they got on set and I said to I said listen I'm going to go for a walk I didn't even, I'd not even met I don't even think I'd met most people on the set that day so I need to go for a walk I'm listening to all these songs because we were doing the most important scene the first day on the first day and I really wanted to to get into it and it did it did um it you know wasn't it was depressing. It wasn't like I was all smiles because it's not that sort of film. But um, yeah, I did all that. When I when I started acting, I was in rooms with people I never ever would have probably spoke to on the street, and who, and it just broadened my whole mindset and made me think about stuff that I never really thought about. But but growing up in Manchester, and I think there's a famous interview where Morris is talking about even though he hates Manchester now. And he's turned, but he we ate him. Yeah, well, everybody. When he was a good man, I still love him though. I can't help it. But when when he did was on an interview time now, you know, when you're northern and from Manchester, you have a a certain feel for life. And he says this interview, you wouldn't understand because you're not from Manchester. And he is right in terms of I have said, you know, things that you know you wouldn't even believe. That I've said I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and and. I think it's just, I mean, I've got nothing to lose. I don't give, I think in a way it's a good way because you think, well, listen, I I just don't give a fuck. I've got nothing to, I'm, I'm very blessed already with um, the stuff that maybe I wish I had that other people have, but then there's also stuff that I know I'm very lucky to have done and being around the world. You know, I've, I've never allowed um, my upbringing or not having much money in my family to, to stop me from, from doing anything and I think as you as you say having that Manchester uh, um, mindset is is very different to to being from somewhere else see I think it is that I think it is mindset I know there's a lot of stories in it and it's been brought out the last couple of days with this Lucas is it Lucas Gage video that was around but but people talking about well you know and working class this and working class that and anything well what is fucking working class anymore and you know most actors that i know aren't fucking working class and not from working class backgrounds so it's it's just another thing that people put on themselves for a reason why they're probably not working you know whereas if that if the mentality is do you know what i'm just gonna i'm gonna make something happen and i know it's not easy but you know it's also not that hard you know i am gonna make something happen i am gonna go out there and i'm gonna put <laughs> out and there is that and 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 i think it is i mean i've said this a thousand times before as well you know manchester in terms of the city is not my favorite place in the world i've been lucky enough to travel and i've been to some amazing places but the people the communities are pretty special and there is that people soon develop that kind you don't have to be born in manchester to develop it i think you do develop that kind of attitude of you know what i'm just gonna fucking have a crack at this and that's what we need more of. We need more people like you who are just going to go, right, all right, well, I'll get all these people together and then I'll, I'll tell them after they've all committed that, you know what, I don't, I mean, I, I, I think that's absolutely fucking amazing. And if my kids did that, I'd be, the, I'd be the proudest dad in the world because it's just like, right, we're here now. It's good. It's a positive story. We're going to do it. And they bought into you in order to do that. You know, the story is just an aside. They bought into you to do that. And that's what we need more people. And certainly in your industry is, and I say your industry, because like I say, you know, I, as much as we're doing stuff with man made productions, I don't want to be in the inside. I, I really don't want to be there. Cause I've seen lots of stuff that. Good move. I, I, yeah. I, I've listened. If my, if my, any of my kids, although I'm trying to get my youngest to play a part in the, pod play Christmas special but he he said no but if any of my kids came up to me and said uh, I want to get involved in in acting I'd have to seriously think about whether I'd want them to do it because you know there's a there's a lot of toxicity involved in that industry and in terms of mental health mental well-being which is what we're about as a charity and what this um, this podcast is about really you know the the underlying theme uh it's probably one of the, the worst industries that I've ever come across for the effects that it has on people's mental well-being. Because you're I, I, constantly being told you're not good enough, and in some cases you're not. Well, yeah, you, it's that simple. No, you're not. The, you, the amount of actors out there, and there are shed loads of them. Not all of them 
I, nowhere. I mean, you know the percentages. A very small percentage you're going to make anywhere near a living at doing it. The, um, the, the thing that, and I had to change my, and it was only through lockdown the first time where, and I think mo- most actors would attest to the fact that there was something bizarre about the lockdown because for the first time in history, in my lifetime since I've been doing acting, there was absolutely zero pressure and zero competition because there was literally not, it didn't exist. Acting and auditions didn't exist. You never woke up one and ever going, oh, why am I going to get an audition today? Why has he got that? Because it didn't exist. So there was this weight that was lifting off for me that was like, you know what? And, and I'll tell you this, it was probably one the happiest I've felt in years. And I had to change my mindset uh, of acting and think, you know what, you need to get, um, you need to just find other things. You need to get on with your life. You need to enjoy the stuff you have, your hobbies. You need to um, find other passions, not in a bad way, but just because the reality of it is, it's like a relationship. If you're too needy with it, you're just going to push it away in time and time again. And you need to just get on with things and let the chips fall where they may. And, when, and if it's meant to be, it will, and it will gravitate you towards them. I'm not, I'm not out the game. I've got a good agent. I've got, I love acting more than anything, but it's important to just go, because the reality of it is, cast and directors will tell you, they know as soon as you enter the room, whether you've got the part, they know because the role is perfect for you. And if you look at maybe a year, you've probably got 300 roles available there's millions and millions and millions. It's the same with football, trying to get, you know, trying to play for a premiership team. But the, re- the difference is there's no expiration day on ours, which we're lucky. And we can do it as when we're 60. But the reality is, it is who you know, but it's also about right place, right time. And, and I have to practice what I preach sometimes because you do get little and you can't help but get little when that director followed me on Twitter the other day you do have a little glimpse, you go fucking out and you do think, oh God, imagine if he did like say they like the film and he put me in there, you know, you, you get a fucking, you know, that podcast the other day, I, you know, it's like you've, I can't, you know, the feeling it's the best thing in the world and when it comes crashing down and it ends up being nothing, it fucking is heartbreaking. But that, that's that's going to happen regardless whether you're Brad Pitt, it doesn't matter, you, better for them that they've got the money and they don't have to worry about that but, it happens no matter your whole career. That is the career, unfortunately, um, I signed up for. And if it's something that I want to continue doing, I've got to have you know a better mindset, I guess. Well, you know what, mate? I think anyone who listens to that, I think you're absolutely spot on. Um, you know, and you're you're living in an industry where ninety odd percent of what you're trying to achieve is completely out of your hands. You know, this whole relationship with casting directors. I mean, I've you know said various things and I, you know I, I i get why they're in the industry and stuff like that but what really really pisses me off is when a casting director knows full well that when they put a post out going oh do you like my new dog and they'll get twenty five thousand likes they'll get all these people coming on going oh that's the best dog i've ever seen in the world and it's people literally selling themselves selling themselves in desperation to try and get the attention of that one person. Didn't know you were that watching. Difference for them. It's it absolutely again as a as a and I look at lots of things and I'm sure Damo does as you know I look at this as a far a lot of the stuff I do I look as a you know as it as a father and I think do I want would I want my kids to be doing that they're that desperate to get the attention of somebody and that person and not all of them. I get that. There's some really good ones out there, but that person, no, they have that power in their hands and that is not healthy. That is not healthy for people's mental well-being. I, th- I think, it it, I think in fair, you know, in fairness to cat, there, there is 99% of them are, are great, you know, are great people, obviously. And I think that if you, I mean, I don't, it's a bizarre game because in theory, casting directors are sort of, they're sort of celebrities, if you like, in terms mm. of, and you know, and it must be bizarre to be in that position and also to be in a position of, you are you are responsible for all these people. And I think most of them, the good ones, you know, are, are you know, they kind of have an approach of, you know, it doesn't work the way you think it does and probably don't like actors that, 
you know, wake their ass every day and stuff like that because that that's ultimately not what it's uh, what it's about. And again, I've been guilty of that in the past. I think I've probably sent out more, you know, from my perspective, I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing the right thing and I'm just sending them emails to show them this and I'm showing that. But then when you look back at your your email history and you've sent them fucking 15 emails a year, you <laughs> Maybe they're looking at you going, well, fucking hell, you, you're being a bit of a stalker. A lot of everything is right time, right place. and But, but you know, you've got to engineer yourself into those positions by making stuff like you've done, by putting yourself about. But ultimately, it is. It's been in the right the right time, the right place, and that's for business. That, I think that's for life. I think it's... I, be, I really be, do. I agree. And I think it's about... I mean, when I was looking off to... To be on that Entourage podcast and speaking to, you know, he, the Doug said, do you want to ask, you know, I, I was dying to ask him so much stuff, but I just, I thought I'm going to ask a question that's pointed. I don't know when I'm going to speak to fucking these people again. And I just said, you know, what advice would you, you know, from an act in, you know, this industry and Kevin Dillon uh, was saying, you know, it's about persistence and it's about just, unfortunately, just be, you've got to be in it to win it and you've just got to keep it is a, it's persistence because, it might not happen, but then you might be in that position where you get that, and it and it's a snowball then. But who? But again, I used to think, oh, I want the career of, you know, I want to be as big as Tom Hardy, and, and it's good to have that bar set high. But at the same time, I would be very happy with just be able to pay. You know, someone said to me, "You're going to act for the rest of your life. You're going to get, you know, one thousand seven hundred pound a month for the rest of your life, but you're going to be acting every day." I would bite your hand off, no problem. So it's not about, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, there's only 1% that are in the absolute Tom Hanks stratosphere. There, are, There is actors out there that probably made millions that you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even yeah. reckon. They've made millions from acting and had a fucking unbelievable career. And um, But it's just about getting that first. It, it, it is, it's, 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 well, if it was easy... Everyone would be doing it. If it was easy, me and Damo would be doing it. What would Damo? Listen, I can tell you right now, De- Damo and Paul, if you got an agent tomorrow, you'd have more, and deadly serious, you'd have more joy than me. Reason being that you're in a better age category. Every man in his dog my age wants to be an actor. Everyone, unfortunately, looks like me. I look like every Hollyoaks actor going, which... I don't want to, but that's just the way, that's the way God made me, unfortunately. I can't help that. I wish I had a bit more ruggedness about me, a broken nose, maybe. I can't help help. I can that. erase that if you want. I can have a chat with Anson <laughs> Pete. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm actually too quick. I've got good head movement. I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> that's growing yeah. up in Drylston, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You go, when you live around there, you've got to be out on the ball. But it's, yeah, it, it's, You've you've really got to enjoy the the you know because it is exciting at the same time the uncertainty of of you know the little things you think oh my god that's happened or this and Twitter and Instagram has made for a great like you say about the platform and and the people you connect with it you know it's truly a because you wouldn't probably met those people in real life but even the fact that you get to speak to them for a message or a, a tweet is quite you know it's still kind of oh it's quite remarkable. Oh, it's never been as easy to get older people. You know, I mean, it's like in the, in the Kisses in the Dark, the podcast series, we've got Con, Con O'Neill in that. I mean, I would have never been able to get through to Con unless it was social media and I kind of hijacked a post and started talking and then he's in, a he's in you know, a seven-part podcast series that we're doing. So, and, and this again, this is what I say to people. It's just, you know, most people, full stop, a, a decent, most people are decent, and if you, you know, and and so you don't have any preconceived ideas about what someone's going to think or whether they'll work with you, whether they won't work with you. Just fucking ask him. Exactly. Ask, and I, ask, ask him. And he said in his, his voice going up, ask him. And that's really, <laughs> yeah. He's lying already in demo. He didn't, he, he, you know, he, he didn't get me, he didn't, didn't want me in the uh, Kisses of the Dark. He only chose his favourites for that. So I didn't get a look in, but. No, um, mate. I've I've wrote about six plays that I've sent to him. Every one of them is thrown straight in the bin. So yeah, don't worry no, about it. I haven't, Listen, got, I haven't thrown them straight in the bin at he all. Has, he has the voice, Dame. Have you heard this husky, soothing voice? He has this voice on the. He's got it there, and he just doesn't utilize it. But well, listen. I do actually because I I am in episode three of Kisses in the Dark, 
as a as a fat policeman who gets killed. And uh, yeah, I'm in that, mate. Honestly, if you, you you've not heard the line, do you want me to do the line for you? Go on, I'm glad to hear the line. Stop. That's one. Right. <laughs> And then uh, there's the really emotional one where I say, who are, what is it now? What what did you do to my friend? What did you do to that lad back there? Who the fuck are you? And you know, do you know, do you know See, what? Liam, that's why you didn't get a part because Paul's actually now putting himself in his own productions. Yeah. And not only that, he's hijacking this podcast to promote, <laughs> promote himself in his own productions. <laughs> Uh, he's got it's got to be done on it no I, they I, already I, fucking hate me anyway don't they in the arts <laughs> they, they already fuck, the, what's he done now it's like well me and them or all the stuff that we're doing because like we know with the charity we have you know we it's a mental well-being charity but we can do whatever and work with whoever we want to work with we're in you know we're that that's we're at that age and that's what we decided to do from the beginning and it's great that we can do all these different things and we've got these people thinking what the fuck are they doing now but that, but everything we're doing is, is, is like I said, underlying is supporting mental well-being, uh, and that's what you've got to do. Keep them guessing, mate. Always well, keep them guessing. Of, uh, there's a no- number of, there's a number of, shall we say, big organisations in Manchester, and we've walked away. So bollocks to you not working with you, and they're like, what? You can't say that to us. I say, well, we don't like your ethics. We don't like the way you're speaking to us, and if you're going to work like that with us. How are you going to help the grassroots, you know, people that are really struggling? I guess it's just trying to talk about it as as much as you can because at the end of the day, I've got certain friends that I know, not because they're pieces of shit or anything, but they just wouldn't understand if I rang them and said, oh, it's just the way it is. And I've got friends that would know exactly what I'm talking about. I know people that ring me who they would never ring anyone else. No one would even know, but they ring me because they know I'll, I'll get, I, you know, I get it. How do you, I, I mean, that's one of the questions, really, I was going to ask. How do you deal with your mental health? Well, I, I definitely am grateful in the fact that I could bullshit you and go, oh, you know, there's days where I just want to take my own life. The reality is I don't, and I'm not at the, I guess, the red alert that some people sadly are, unfortunately. Hopefully it never gets to that touch wood. Um, I guess for me, it's more the anxiety and just, you know, one minute, like this now, I could be, and then I might after this just have an absolute meltdown just because I'm thinking about the, you know, the future or this and that, you know, this, I know. And when, um, what happened to my mum that you know about Paul, I didn't forget, I just forgot about all this shit that I was worrying about. And it just, it, it just a point to say it, it, it's just irrelevant. But when something is not, when something happens like that in your life where you, you don't think about the other stuff, it just goes to show you that it's not irrelevant and it's about staying in the moment. And for me, it's always been been exercise. I've always done, you know, boxing and MMA and I've always wanted to train. And for me, I I, I have, you know, I go for runs, I'll do this. But for me, I'm, I'm just 100, 100 miles an hour all the time. I need to be doing something all the time, whether it's watching a film, even watching a film, I watch everything I'm, doing this I'm doing that and I just think for me that's that's what helps me manage it but there is plenty of days where I'm just like fuck I'm in a, a world of trouble here and, and most of it and that's why I had to change my mindset it came it came from acting you know the one day I'd be fucking crying in my room going oh this fucking acting thing is just fuck it it's just a waste of time and then I'll wake up the next day and go fuck I just can't quit I need to uh, I need to keep going so it's uh, you know and then what money worries or whatever but the reality is you, your alternatives are you keep going or you don't. And sadly, for a lot of people, it, it ends up becoming, I don't, and I don't want to have that mindset. I want to treat it like a an athlete sport, which is weird, but to me, I treat it as I, I, will, I, am, I am too motivated to allow me to get to that stage. I would never, I can't allow it to happen for me. I think that's, I mean, you know, we've chatted loads uh, during lockdown about different things. And, you know, and, and at times you said, right, that's it. I'm knocking it on the head. And then other times it's like, no, I've got this great idea. And, yeah. and, and you know, and that, and that's, you know, that's how we work. That me and him are like that all the time. You should see it. Well, you don't want to see our WhatsApp messages as it is. But the mentality you've got now of this kind of, 
I know I'm an actor and what will be will be as long as I keep doing what I'm what I'm doing. And, you know, and if it happens, it happens, but not putting that pressure on you to make to make something happen that in, in reality, unless you do it yourself, you don't have that much control over. And I think I've seen it in terms of our conversations. I think since you um, since you've kind of decided that's the way you're going to look at it, I can, I can see a massive difference it, it just in our, in our conversations. And that's not, not to say you're still not, you still won't get an- anxious about stuff or worry about things, but you've made, you've made a decision that is, beneficial to your mental well-being mate there's, I th- I not, think, there's no two ways about it yeah and, and and listen it's not it's not a competition of poor me poor me and poor you but i think you know and that's not even you know everyone's got these event you know your, your personal life as well but i just know we're in this world now of other people's successes are different or other people's failures or whatever and it's about just knowing for me you know i used to be very bad at comparing myself and this and that and i think it's it's just about knowing that, you know, I'm still very lucky with the stuff I've got. I'm very lucky I'm in this position. I've got to do amazing things, but I just set the bar. So my problem is I set the bar so high. It's like the toughest battle thing to me. That's fucking done. I don't give a shit about it because it's done. I don't want to be sat talking about it in 20 years time. I want to be fucking sat in 20 years time with an Oscar going, listen, i am won this and I'm just a council estate uh, rat bag from Jaws then but listen if I can fucking do it anyone can and that and I want to be able to you know maybe you know I don't give a fuck about it. The, well do you know what the reality is people that go I don't care for awards <laughs> they're lying because I tell you right yeah. now I don't care for awards but if I won a BAFTA or not <laughs> I'd be <laughs> so that's uh, not- that lie to yeah, but Liam that that thing that you've just said and you've said it a number of times mate and it's being that example for others and that's an absolute uh, key thing of what I do, of what Paul does. It's not about me. I want my kids to do better than me. I want other people to do better than me, but I've got to do that by showing an example, by growing up in Clayton, never ever being told that I could work for myself, that I could be self-employed, the charity sector, I was told, go and get a job like it, stay there. That was it. That was how I was brought up. And it was only through my own experiences and thinking, nah, fuck this. I'm not being put in a box. I'll I'll keep doing this until somebody stops me. Do you know, that it's that mentality. And like you said earlier, a lot of that comes down to not having a care about yourself. Do you know it? So it's a, it's quite a weird, it's two sides of a coin in some way. It's probably been my success that I didn't have any value. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, I didn't care. And so what if, uh, you know, what if I got locked up? What if uh, something happened, you know, but then you find meaning and mine was having my kids, you know, and, and then it was like, I have to prove to them that there's a better way of doing things. And I want them to step on my shoulders and move forward. You know, I, I would always say this and it's interesting. And, and you and Paul, you know, can answer me this question. I have got a fear of when it comes to chill, you know, Pray I've not got any children running around because, listen, I used to lead a very uh, mysterious lifestyle. So I'm hoping there's no there's no children anywhere. But on a serious note, I have this fit because, um, you know, not to go into, but I, I, I have to, for me, from previous, I have to, you know, I look at being a parent as it's something I'm, I'm very excited about one day and I look at it as you shouldn't, but I look at it as it's something that would mean a lot to me more than anything to be a great great dad because for for reasons I don't want to go into whatever I, I want to something I really look forward to but I also wor- I also think would I I have a fear of would I not be a good dad because I, I really would be uh, what's the word um, I would hate the kid in terms of because it's took me away from my acting for example if I had to get this because I can't I've got children now, I've got responsibilities would I resent the child, but also would it flip me on its ear and go, you've got a child, you've got even more drive because it's now even more important. The the most important things in my life are my kids. And, you know, you always worry about what they're going to do and what, you know, are they going to be happy and stuff like that. But if any of my kids, and I can't say this, I can't stress this enough. If any of my kids wanted to get involved in your world, as in the arts, 
you're one of the few people that I would that I would get them to speak to because I know they would get a genuine, honest, very honest answer and they wouldn't get all the bullshit. Um, and I genuinely mean that. You know, I mean, I, I know a lot of people now involved in it. Some of them, I wouldn't let them near my kids um, because, well, the, you know, the, I just wouldn't. Toxic. Yeah, toxic. Whereas... Um, I wouldn't have any issues at all with them speaking to to you, Liam, and, and that's that's the kind of regard that I hold you in. Let alone the fact that you know you made a film which I think will have will have changed people's lives by watching it. Even just to say, you know what, I'm not feeling great. I'm going to go to the doctors. That's a massive, and you'll never know. I mean, Damo says it to me all the time. It's all the stuff that we do. The re- I mean, we we get some feedback, which is amazing, but. Most of it, we'll never know. We'll never know what lives we've impacted. Yeah. Um, and, and once you get that in your head, then you think, all right, well, we'll just carry on. And you wait you wait to get the, the decent thing. It's always great getting nice feedback. I mean, it's always great saying, you know what, you're a great actor. Of course. Oh, you're really good there, mate. But just, you just keep, and again, I keep saying, he says, keep on doing what you're doing. You're one of the you- most genuine blokes I've ever met. Uh, and I'm fucking old, mate. I mean, you know, me and Damo are in, are in our, you know, we wake up in the morning and it's like fucking great. <laughs> Do you know, that's the first thing. It's like, and then you try I'm and awake. get out of bed and everything hurts and you go, oh shit, not again. <laughs> that's why I, I only do to do lists in the morning. There's no point doing them the night before. You were saying about your mum and what happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, well, in through lockdown, um, you know, a random day of <clears throat> whether it, you know, whatever a day was, we were going to uh, visit in, and um, my mum said, you know, at the time we were getting ready to leave. I, you know, was literally locking the door, and my mum was like, you know, I feel, I feel a bit funny, I feel a bit sick, I'm going to have to sit down, and you know, I said, oh, you're right, and she just said, oh, you just get me the ball, come in when we're sick, and even you know, I, you know, she said, oh, don't if I bet summer, you know, I said, yeah, fair enough, and then a net, you know, she said a neck was really in pain and. And she went, you know, I think you better call. I said, listen, I've already called the ambulance because I don't want to, you know, I don't know what's going on here. And and in my mind at the time, I, you know, even I didn't think, uh, I thought maybe she was responding. The paramedics came. We couldn't go because of COVID. But I got on with my day. I thought, you know, maybe she's got food. But, you know, the paramedics didn't really look, you know, they were pot. They didn't, they, we thought it was just something, you know, whatever. Uh, and then I went on my day and then I got a call from the doctor saying that, you know, she had a, a very severe bleed to the brain and and it was, they'd have, they'd have to operate quick, which at the time, you know, out of all the things I've gone through in my life, I don't think, you can't, you know, prepare for anything like that. And it was a, it was a bizarre experience, surreal of just, I didn't even know where I was at the time. And I remember going home thinking, fuck. And, um, and then I had to tell my stepdad and my brother because they were still at work. And then the we got a call later on that night, and the doctor was saying, "You know, you 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 know, you're probably best facetiming because we don't know if this operation is going to work. The next four hours are going to be critical. We really, you know, and I and I'm not a strong individual in the slightest. I was my brother. Um, I think I've seen him cry twice. He's a very strong individual, a, an unbelievable." <clears throat> um, strong mindset and um, and I was just in tears I couldn't even speak <clears throat> to my mum on FaceTime because I just thought and, and it's having that thing of I thought that you shouldn't but prepare for the worst and I just I just had it in my head that I just can't see this going you know my mum doesn't drink she doesn't smoke she's very healthy 63 year old woman. I thought you know what? why is this happening and I remember and this is the the I guess the uh, the more light in the heart of the story, but the bottom line is she she did the operation. It was a success. She she got home very lucky. She was at Salford Royal, one of the best uh, hospitals for neurology in the world. Very lucky, and you know it was just hard because we couldn't go in and see her. But she got home. She's you know literally had a first shift. She only worked part time as as an optical assistant. She had a first shift last week. She's a uh, you know things are going very well. But I remember. Uh, praying at the time um, saying you know 
please just take it. You know, I don't give a shit about acting, anything. Just take it all away from me, please. You've just got to get my mum home because this is fucking... Um, you've just got to please... Because uh, Irish people only pray when we want some, obviously. <laughs> I was praying, and then when she got home, and oh no, we got the call saying the operation was a success and she's recovering well. I remember praying again, saying, you know, I know what I said about acting, but please don't take it away. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so please. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so happy that my mum's back, but please don't take I was I was kind of joking, but please. So, <laughs> Bottom line is, yeah, when, when that was going on, the stuff that I was worrying about, I couldn't even give it, I didn't even give it a split second thought. The the bad side of it is now she's home and she's things are going well. These things are starting to creep in again. And I'm thinking, listen, you need to remember that you didn't give a shit about this for three months ago. This is important. And I'm very, you know, and the, and the, the upside is I don't live, I'm at a position where I'm at my mom, my parents at the moment. But in a way, it's something I'll be grateful for. I've got to look after my mum. I've got to spend a lot of time with her. And that's fucking stuff that I'm never going to get back. So I really don't give a shit whether I'm living at home with my mum at 30 anyway. When girls come round, I just turn the pictures round. It's not a big deal. Your parents are a turn off there, Liam. Oh, dear. Listen, mate, you saved your mum's life. I, I said to you, you saved your mum's life and you will always, always, always be her favourite child now. And you should always get the biggest Christmas present, uh, the best birthday present, and you should throw it into everything. It's like, you know, 10 o'clock at night, I want cheese and toast, mum. She goes, I'm a bit tired. Mum, mum, I saved you your old, life. Oh, time. But she, what she does do is she goes, oh, you know, you're brewing up. I've had a brain operation. I go, <laughs> you know. You wouldn't know because you don't talk about it every single. So, um, no, it's and, and 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 listen for that in general. It is when I'm feeling whatever. I take myself back to that moment and I go, "Fucking hell!" Do you know what? You could be singing a, a different tune this Christmas uh, and not having your mum here, and 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 it was. Uh, and I won't but get emotional, but uh, yeah, it's. I'm very very grateful for what for the you know she was. The nurse back to health and the great people at Salford Royal and I couldn't see him to even thank him and I remember I tweeted them and they got in touch with me and it was you know I couldn't go in to say thank you but you know amazing um, stuff and I'm very yeah I'm very very grateful that she's safe and sound and it was a yeah a, a traumatic but you know an experience that I think in a way did me did me a lot of good if I'm honest because I think it yeah changed, changed me for the better I mean, it's amazing Same, that she's got through that, mate, and that, and you know we're thankful as well for you. But to have also have that extra thing of having that reference point and actually acknowledging you've now got that reference point, you know, of if you drift into and get caught up in the day to day nonsense, you know, like we all do, and start thinking that it's really important. You can, if you just step back and think, hang on, take myself back to that moment, you know, and, and what was I thinking then? Do you know what I mean? It's to put into what you said there, it's, it ties in with the acting a bit of, you know, a friend told, you know, a director, a director of my short film, like I told you, Paul said, you know, at the end of the day, this is the reality. We're not, we're not trying to change the world here. It's acting and it's a great profession to be in. I would have loved to be in it. I love it with all my heart. But at the end of the day, it's fucking irrelevant when it comes to my family or anything like that, because... You know, at that time when I did say the first prayer, I did mean that. I generally did mean you could take it acting away, even though I regretted saying it. I generally, <laughs> I generally did mean that. And at the end of the day, the uh, Jim said to me, you know, most actors, unfortunately, it's like a soldier going to battle. They already know in the mind that people are not going to make it. They know that they're going to lose colleagues. And most actors, unfortunately, don't accept from the start, this may not happen. And it's not having a mindset of you being a defeatist. It is it is the way it is. So when it comes to family stuff and that, I have to go, well, listen, this this is what's important really. And, and you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. So that's, that's what I took from that. Listen, mate, I think that's a great way to, uh, to end it. And listen, it's been, it's been great to chat to you, mate. Um, thanks so much for coming on. You're listening to That Great Mank Pod. 
Greater Manchester's community podcast. Top one, our kid. Go!